national and government engagement team in the Australian Space Agency and the agency point of contact for India engagement. Uh, thank you for finding the time to join us today uh, for the International Space Investment India Projects webinar. Uh, please note that we are recording this webinar and it will be made available to all participants uh, once we've finalised uh, today. Uh, there are quite a few people uh, participating today and I think some people are still joining us uh, from the lobby. So thank you for the everyone for uh, joining us online. Uh, to ensure we can get through all of the presentations and provide all of the relevant information, we ask that people be respectful to the presenters and other participants and uh, mute their microphones. Uh, there, will, there will be a Q&A session at the, end, at the conclusion of the webinar, and we welcome your questions on this program. Uh, feel free to start adding your questions to the chat teams function, and we will work through them at the end of the formal presentations. Uh, next slide, please, Arvind. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Indigenous Australians are our first scientists and astronomers. Their knowledge and contributions to Australian science are reflected through the recognisable Australian Space Agency brand that our agents so proudly wear, and you can see um, in my background there as well. I live and work in Adelaide or Tandanya on Ghana country, and my agency colleagues are joining us from Canberra or Ngunnawal country. Hobart, Mwinina country, Sydney, Ayora country. Uh, the Australian Space Agency acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, thank you, Arvind. Uh, so, um, Enrico, the head of the Australian Space Agency, unfortunately is unable to join us today, but he's very excited about the ISI India program and sends his best wishes to us all. So our presenters today, um, Aud Vignel, the Chief Technology Officer, uh, Arvind Ramana, Agency Project Program Lead, uh, Dr. Elise Alanda, um, Agency Project Lead, and myself. Uh, so we'll all talk through the guidelines and the ISI India grant program with you today. Our next slide please, Arvind. We also have a number of presenters from the agency and other government departments who will provide you information today that will hopefully assist with applying for and navigating the grant program. Uh, so Alastair Kay, Director of the Office of the Space Regulator, Mark Arkell uh, from Space Systems Teams of the Australian Communications and Media Authority, uh, uh, Sobre uh, Sapre, Technical uh, Assessor for the uh, Defence Export Controls, uh, Tamara Bell uh, from Austrade, and Pete Hunter from the Grants Delivery and Business Services. So all of these people will present today and um, hopefully assist um, uh, you in, in um, applying for the grants. Uh, the next slide, please, Arvind. So I've got the agenda up on the screen. Uh, we'll be going, walking through the program and guidelines. So Arvind and Elise uh, will talk through that. Um, and Aud will also uh, provide a bit of background uh, to, the, uh, to the ISI India program. At around 4.30 uh, Eastern Standard Australian time or 11 o'clock India time, uh, Alastair will talk through the Office of the Space Regulator presentation and we'll have a number of external uh, present presenters as well as I discussed on the previous slide. Um, and we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A um, at, at around 5.30 Eastern Standard Time, Australia, or 12 o'clock India time. Uh, if we can't get through all the questions today, uh, we will endeavour to answer them all when we provide the presentation uh, to you after the conclusion of today's events. So uh, uh, just another reminder that uh, this is being recorded, so feel free to um, just take in information and we'll provide all that information to you in a pre-recorded package. Uh, thank you very much. I will now hand you over to the Chief Technology Officer, Aud Vignel, to discuss the background of the project. Thank you, Aud. Thank you very much. Um, 
will be short because we have a lot to cover, but uh, just a reminder, ISI were the first uh, program that the agency launched after our creations that was launched in 2019. Most of these projects and the 10 that you have in front of you, you can find all the details in our website. Uh, most of them have completed. I think we're just wrapping up a couple. Uh, sometimes it's small amounts. Uh, I think the smallest was $200,000, but the impact that this grant has done for these companies who have received the grants have been enormous. And I think it was very very successful program um, that has allowed uh, this company to grow and, and promote their work and we're doing that every day. So um, I am personally very looking forward to uh, receive submission for the ASI India um, and helping uh, companies to grow and be successful and grow the capability of Australia. Thank you. Over to you, Arvind. Thank you, Ard. Um, so Space is an international endeavor, and hence, uh, as Odd mentioned, after the successful and oversubscribed ISI grants program, ISI India projects was officially announced in 2022. Um, so this stream was uh, intended to support direct industry to industry space sector projects between Australia and India. When we say industry, we include uh, academia as, as well, and Elise will talk about that in detail. So this ISI India project stream was a part of the DFAT led economic strategy to 2035 India package, focusing on strengthening our bilateral relationships with the mutual understanding of common interests and shared values among our great nations. So ISI India program is a Commonwealth grant program that will comply to the Commonwealth grant rules and guidelines. Uh, the agency has experience in running successful grant programs in the past, and hence the lessons learned from the various grant programs we have run has been implemented across the ISI India program now. So it was a moment of pride for all of us to see the opening of the ISI India grant program featured in the joint statement from our prime ministers. And with that announcement, we officially opened the intakes on the 14th of March. So we have highlighted some of the key uh, points from the joint press statement recognizing the importance of space the prime ministers agreed to strengthen the cooperation uh, in various topics including sustainable and secure use of space uh, the prime ministers stressed the importance of india australia collaboration in the field of space should be fostered in various topics including scientific research space applications and production and launch of satellites with that the prime ministers announced the isi india stream to be open so from 2022 onwards, from when this program was announced, we wanted to make sure that uh, this was a collaborative approach when we designed the ISI India program. Um, the program design started in 2022 and uh, we wanted to hear inputs, implement changes and make this collaborative process. So over uh, 10 rounds of consultations and meetings with approximately around 500 participants from across industry partners in India and Australia and participation from our Indian government colleagues. Um, the meetings were held and we identified a number of priority areas where we want to focus this grant program on. And this was uh, mutually developed and uh, areas are as follows. Earth observation, leapfrog R&D, uh, which we call as applied space medicine and life sciences which includes the topic of space medicine and life sciences and microgravity experiments, space situational awareness, position navigation and timing, sustainable use of space, exploration and science, and aligned areas that support uh, several of these topics that include advanced manufacturing, AI, cyber security, and workforce development. And having said that, we are not excluding any other topics from this program as well. Uh, this was a strong input that we received from the industry and our colleagues in India. There are enablers such as access to space, which are also fundamental to supporting all of our other priority areas. So if your topic does not fall directly within the mutual priority areas that have been highlighted here, we still look forward to receiving your application uh, with an explanation in your application on how your topic supports or enables the mutual priority areas. So the mutual priority areas that we identified have a natural alignment to the Australian government's list of critical technologies, which are listed here, that are sensing, navigation and timing, AI computing and communications, biotechnology, gene technology and vaccines, quantum technologies, energy and environment, 
transportation, robotics and space, advanced materials and manufacturing. So it is this alignment and spin off benefits that make space important. And hence, we hope to see these projects that generate benefits to life on Earth come through via this program. We have drawn these links out as examples and we look forward to working with our applicants and grantees to strengthen these connections. So with that, I will hand over the stage to Elise Allender, who will run us through all the details of the grant and the grant process. Thank you. Over to you, Elise. Good afternoon, everyone, and also good morning. Um, I am just going to give you an overview of the program itself. Uh, so starting up with the program objectives, you can see them laid out here. So we have got uh, the objectives of the program are to unlock international opportunities for the Australian sector uh, to work on collaborative projects with the Indian sector. Um, we would like to extend the capability and capacity of the Australian sector and also uh, support job creation through collaboration with, uh, with Indian organisations and partners. Um, we'd also like to demonstrate the Australian sector's ability to successfully deliver space related products and services internationally and also support projects which contribute to building a vision um, of a diverse and inclusive sector uh, that inspires businesses, the Australian uh, and Indian communities and the next generation of the space workforce. Uh, and finally, we'd like to inc uh, support increased investment in the sector, targeting those mutual priority areas that Arvind just mentioned. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. So the this grant opportunity, um, it's an open competitive grant program. You can find all the information uh, on uh, business.gov.au. Um, it has been informed by uh, at least 10 rounds of stakeholder consultation, which I expect many of you participated in, uh, and also informed by some of the lessons learned from our previous programs um, as well. So we intend to support missions, uh, payloads or technologies uh, beginning um, at approximately TRL4 and above. Um, so it's not so much uh, the feasibility and, and concept studies that we're looking at, it's actually supporting technology development uh, and space and operations. Um, and the minimum uh, grant award you can receive is $1 million and the maximum amount is $10 million. And the justification um, that you'll provide in your applications um, will essentially depend on the scope of your project. So if you're developing technology or developing uh, the full scope of a mission, um, that will obviously uh, affect the amount that you're requesting. And projects are to be completed uh, by March 2026. So we're looking at having approximately just over two and a half years uh, to complete projects under this opportunity. Um, next slide, please, Avind. So eligibility, this is, you'll find all of this information um, in the guidelines document, but I just am going to walk you through um, each of these bullet points. So you are eligible for the program um, if you are an entity incorporated in Australia or a publicly funded research organisation. Um, this applies to the lead applicant, obviously. So the person that submits the application must be um, must be an Australian lead. Uh, this is only because um, it's the lead applicant who will enter into um, the legal, the binding grant agreement with the Commonwealth. So we will only accept uh, applications where you can provide evidence from your board or your CEO, if you don't have a board, um, that they support the project and that you're able to complete it and meet all project costs that aren't covered by the grant funding. You'll need to uh, have at least a million dollars in eligible expenditure. Um, and you can see in the grant guideline document as well, I think it's Appendix B, there's a list of um, all the different types of eligible expenditure there that you can refer to. Uh, and the million dollars here is because that's the minimum grant amount that we can award. Um, you'll also need to provide evidence of support from your Indian partnering organisation, or you can have more than one uh, if you like, uh, to prove that your project has links to India's space industry um, or the supply chains. And you'll also need to provide evidence that a minimum of 80% of the investment will be made in Australia um, for the benefit of Australian space industry organisations. Um, next slide, please. So just a quick word on joint applications. We do encourage these, um, but as I mentioned, you will need an Australian lead to enter into an agreement with the Commonwealth. 
we will uh, we do encourage a mixture of both industry and academic partners. So um, yeah, do welcome applications across the board there. So in your application, you'll need to identify um, obviously all the members of your proposed group and each of the project partners will need to provide a letter of support. And I won't go through um, all of those bullet points there because they are all in the guideline document, but you will essentially need to provide details of the project partner, their responsibilities um, and what they'll contribute to the project. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just quickly run through the assessment criteria. Uh, this first one, they are weighted slightly differently. So the first criteria involves uh, you describing the benefit of your project to the Australian space industry, and it will be worth 30 points. Um, the sub points under each of these criteria are all equally weighted. So you should demonstrate a uh, benefit of your project by describing how it will build the capability and capacity of the Australian industry. Um, how a minimum of 80% of the investment will be made in Australia for the benefit of Australian space industries, how the project will support job creation in the Australian industry, and how it will contribute to building a vision uh, and a diverse and inclusive space ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please, Arvind. So criterion two. This one relates more to your project's ability to grow and strengthen collaborations with the Indian sector. So you can um, demonstrate this by describing how you'll unlock opportunities for the uh, Australian space sector, how you grow your collaborations um, by delivering products and services to the Indian industry. Um, and this is also the criterion where you will describe the mutual priority area that your project will, um, will be categorised under and how it will advance capability within there. Um, but as Arvind mentioned, if, if your project doesn't fall within a specific priority area, that's absolutely fine. Just please demonstrate in your application that how it aligns with one of the mutual priority areas or how it might advance capability within one of those. Um, and I have just put along the bottom here, when you're constructing your response, you might want to refer to either the Australian Space Agency's published roadmaps um, or the civil space strategy for some of the technologies um, and capabilities that, um, that we're looking at advancing. Next slide, please. Uh, so criterion three, this one relates to you and your fellow applicants. So your capability, uh, capacity and resources to deliver the project. This one's worth 20 points. And this is where you can describe um, everything about yourself and your project partners, um, your track record managing previous projects and the personnel that you uh, either already um, employ or your access to personnel um, with all the right skills to deliver the project. Um, you can outline your access to infrastructure and equipment and technology and any intellectual property um, you may require or that you might generate and uh, how you'll ensure that your project will continue to deliver outcomes, not just in the grant period, but beyond the grant funding period. And here you should also um, describe your strategy to manage the project and you, it should include things like scope, um, methodology and timeframes, um, risk management uh, activities and how you plan to secure the required regulatory or other approvals. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, a financial focus question. So the impact of grant funding on your project, and this one's also worth 20 points. So here is where um, you can provide information about the total investment that your grant will uh, leverage any uh, contributions and co-contributions that you will provide to the project um, and the sources that these come from, whether project partners, state and territory governments, investors or veg um, venture capitalists. And you can also describe here um, your plans for unlocking future investments if you don't have any uh, co-contributions um, at the time. So plans for unlocking future investments and opportunities in the sector as a result of your project activities. And just a note here that we um, don't require co-contributions as an eligibility criterion for this grant. Um, but if you do have some, then this is the criterion that you um, will want to provide evidence for these. Next slide, please. So there are a number of key documents that you'll have to provide alongside your application. 
and we we have put templates for all of these on the BGA page. So the first uh, document you'll need to provide is a project plan. And this is really where um, the bulk of the supporting information for your application will sit. So it'll be somewhere you can provide your um, strategic plan or your uh, technical management plan, your risk management strategies, um, how you will manage IP across your consortium um, and so forth. So it, it can be um, a fairly large document and, and you'll see in the template that we've provided, but it's essentially supporting information um, for the for the answers you'll provide on your online application. Um, you'll also need to provide a project budget and we have also um, put a template for this. It's a fairly straightforward one um, on the BGA page. You'll need to provide evidence of support from your board or CEO. And uh, this is a letter of support that will have to be signed by someone um, at the executive level. Um, we do have a template as well for that. Um, you'll need to provide a letter of support or an MOU from your Indian partnering organisation as well as if you're submitting a joint application, um, a letter of support from each of your project partners and, and the template is also online. Um, you can also provide a trustee here if, if that's applicable to your application. And I, I just wanted to flag um, in the application system, there is a two meg limit when you're uploading individual documents and a total upload limit of 20 meg. So when you're preparing larger documents like that project plan, you might like to, um, when you're putting it together, you might like to split it by section, for example, strategic management plan, technical management plan, just so you are staying underneath that two meg limit and you don't run into um, an error message at, at the wrong time. Uh, finally, if you are successful, there is one more document that you'll need to provide, and this is a partnering uh, partners agreement. Um, this template that we've provided online, it's non-mandatory. Um, but it's essentially a guide to show you the kinds of things we'd like you to think about um, among your project partners. So how you will divide up your IP and maybe the strategy that you might have should a dispute arise among your partners. So do take a look at it. Um, these are all uh, these are all mandatory to provide, but um, yeah, some of the templates are just there for guidance. Gardens. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, this one um, I've just included because uh, when we send you the slides, you'll have all the links to these documents directly um, in the slide deck, so we can skip this one. OK, so as an indicative timeline, we've got today, uh, the 28th of March, the uh, webinar. The next um, activity uh, in the timeline is the industry roundtable. So this is on the 12th of April in two weeks time. Um, the roundtable, so if you're looking at forming a joint application, it's going to be for organisations who would like to submit a, a joint application, but perhaps you would like to meet potential collaborators uh, to join your consortium. And so the format that we'd like to have for this is um, if you've registered and if you haven't, uh, please go to the BGA page and register in the Eventbrite link for this. Um, once you've registered, uh, you'll be able to provide one slide to present on the day. And we are thinking um, each organization will provide three to five minute pitch to this slide. And then the agency can facilitate connections between organizations um, at the end of the round table session. Uh, following the round table, we have a 12 or 13 weeks that the application system is open for. Um, applications close on the 13th of June. And then there'll be a period of uh, assessment and uh, approval, uh, which will then result in an announcement we have put around September or October. And so at this time, um, this is when grant agreements will be, uh, when the grant will be awarded, grant agreements will be negotiated, um, and projects can begin as soon as the grant agreements have been executed. So following that, you'll have uh, just over two and a half years uh, to complete your projects, which end in March 2026. Uh, OK, next slide, please. Oh, so with that, we are right on time. Um, I might ask Alastair Kay from the Office of the Space Regulator um, to, to turn on his microphone and uh, 
give an introduction to the activities uh, involved in um, the OSR. So, Alistair, if you're there. Yeah, thank you, you, Elise. Thank you. Um, before I start, I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the lands from which we meet um, today and pay my respects uh, to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people that are joining us on this call today. Um, as Elise mentioned, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm representing the Office of the Space Regulator. Um, and the Australian Space Agency through the Office of the Space Regulator is responsible for administering the Space Launches and Returns um, Act. Under that act, um, you need to be authorised for a series of, um, of space activities conducted in Australia, or uh, if you're an Australian national, you need to be authorised to conduct um, uh, space activities uh, that are undertaken overseas. Um, I'm, I, I'll just touch on some of these because um, obviously when you're, when you're, as your projects progress, um, we are more than happy to, to talk further. Um, but it's important to understand that um, if, you, if you're intending to operate a launch um, facility um, or undertake an, a launch from Australia, um, you need a, a license or a permit uh, to do so. Um, you also, if you're launching a high power rocket, uh, that is um, under going to go under 100 kilometres in altitude. You also um, need to um, uh, get approval um, through the Australian Space Agency. Um, rockets other than high power rockets uh, come under fall under the the remit of the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Um, if you're a, an Australian national um, and you want to and you have a payload, you, you and if you own all or a part of a space object that is launched from overseas, um, you need to uh, apply and be um, a, a receive approval for an overseas payload permit. Um, if you're an Australian national seeking to return a space object overseas, or if you are if if you're anyone seeking to return a space object to Australia, you you need to seek a return um, authorization. Um, it's important. Uh, if you are planning any of these activities to reach out to us um, early um, and understand what your obligations are, we're very happy to talk people through the process of applying um, and we're very happy to support uh, you to understand the information that you need to provide to us um, in order to receive authorization. Um, but to give you an indication, our estimated time um, from uh, application uh, through to receiving an approval for an overseas payload permit, uh, which is a, a, a more simple and straightforward process, um, is about three months. Um, and for the more complex activities such as launch facility licenses or Australian launch permits, we estimate that the process take, will take um, it can, will take around six months. Um, for the more complex activities, though, we do sit down with uh, applicants and we actually plot out. Um, a more detailed time frame that suits your um, particular circumstance. Um, and that that allows us to try and provide some level of certainty about the timing that you can expect to receive and provi uh, provide and receive feedback on documentation and move through the application process. Um, the main message that I wanted to, to give today, though, um, was just to really notify you that, um, that any of these activities do require an authorization. Um, and to notify us early and reach out early um, if you're if you're undertaking any of these activities. So um, next slide, please, Arvind. Um, more information can be found at the website um, or email us at, at regulation at space.gov.au. Um, as I mentioned, we're very happy to talk you through uh, to through uh, talk you through what's required. Um, that's probably enough for me. Thanks. Over to whoever's next. Thanks, Alistair. Um, and just a note, if anyone has questions relating to any of the presentations for the invited speakers, just hold them to the very end and we'll um, we'll put them to the speakers there. Um, so next up, we have Mark Arkell um, from ACMA to talk about space and spectrum management licensing, if that's required for your project. So Mark, if you're there. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for the invitation to speak today. So I'm going to guess I'm going to have a couple of similar messages of my previous speaker. So the main thing would be that consider spectrum early in your planning. Um, the other one would be 
really seek some professional help because not everyone needs to be a spectrum expert. And also think about what you're doing and whether there's opportunities to outsource some of your product to other partners because in the end, not everyone needs to operate an earth station to communicate in space. So there may be synergies of other people in the space synergy that where you can outsource that aspect to other people and focus on your core project. Um, so my presentation today is very general and at the end of it, there's a list of references that may be useful. You want to help out, help in the future. And I guess my main thing to note is why I represent the ACMA. Some of the observations I'm passing today are probably more of a personal nature than necessarily views of ACMA itself. Uh, next slide, please. So here we go. So just a quick buzz. ACMA or ACMA, or however you want to call it, is an independent statutory authority. Independent regulators, around 450 staff in, in us. We do a range of things. In the space area, is about a team of seven people where two-ish, three-ish people talk about what we'd be working on today. Um, I guess the, this presentation, probably two things to note, we do licensing of earth stations and we do manage the ACA's participation in the international ITU satellite process. And, and when I take talk about earth stations, we mean communicating of anything that goes into space or intended to go to space. So if your rocket goes up into space, and while we don't have a hard definition, we normally use the sort of 100 kilometres, which the space agency does, then you're licensed as a earth station. If you're not, we, you, we use some sort of other licensing arrangements. And if we go to the next slide. So an apology, I think some of the formatting got lost in the translation here. But anyway, so the, the main thing to note about earth station licensing is that Frequency coordination is undertaken by external people. ACMA started to outsource frequency coordination work in the mid 90s, 90s. So we don't have any in house frequency coordination uh, capability, or not very little. Um, when it comes to space, because of the, because often you can't have hard and fast coordination rules, often there's a requirement to seek the views of an existing licensee just to check whether they're going to have any issues with what you're doing because often in space it's a time coordination thing or the other party being aware and I, I guess the, the other message is that spectrum is shared and I'll probably repeat that a couple of times so don't assume you can put your earth station wherever you want there are restrictions normally we car carriage earth station to be in outside metropolitan areas and if you look at the example of the picture here basically we got um what's called S-band for space operations. It's commonly used for TT and C support for a variety of launch and satellite control activities. You'll see most of the dots here are outside capital cities. The ones that are still in capital cities are sort of sort of long-term existing sites that were been there for a long time. Um, and we don't see it in this band. In the picture, this band is also shared with things like fixed point-to-point -point links, defence aeronautical telemetry actuations, and wireless video cameras used for coverage of news and sport, just which obviously the reason why you don't, can't use it in capital city, it's used with other things. Um, <clears throat> and I guess one of the key parts of licensing is we always look to see what you're doing is consistent with an ITU filing. And there I'll probably say you don't need an IT filing for a thing like a rocket that goes up and back because it's not in space long enough to start providing communication services. But anything that's intended to stay in space for a period of time, and don't ask me exactly what a period in time means, it's it's not precisely defined, but basically you will, will need an IT filing to support that. Um, probably thing to note is that we have a cost recovery arrangement, so fees reply to everything we do. Um, you find a link to the fees at the back of the presentation. The other thing is, as accredited persons, a private company, they will charge for their services as well. And to go back to the collaboration point, when it comes to S band, for example, you can see there's a range of existing locations. Not all of them might you be available, but our general view is that we like to co-locate Earth Station because it minimises the impact on other services. So 
why my goal is to provide space, it's to promote space in a way that minimizes the impact on other services. So in other words, I don't not look necessarily looking for more dots on the map. I'm looking for more dots at the same location, if that sort of makes sense. Uh, next slide, please. And apologies, I, I do tend to run through this pretty fast. Um, so, so this is when it comes to I2 filing, I just want to emphasize that spectrum can be complex and it has, and if you see in this picture, there's various paths between satellite and earth stations. And each of those little paths has an ITU rule which you have to understand and be prepared, prepared to manage. It does depend on what frequency bands and what type of services that you might want to provide. And the other thing, if you want to note, to go back to my collaboration effort, um, for some of you who've been in the spa Australian space industry for a while, you probably recognise more than I do that there's various universities and research organisations working in space, and we've made a number of IT satellite filing for them. And I think most of those, most of those names listed there, which I've extracted off a publicly available website, would be recognisable to most. But my observation, particularly when it comes to sort of the CubeSat small site model, the communications needs are often the same. So we, so this is where I pitch the collaboration effort that, you know, if there's four parties with different research goals but have common communication needs, to me, I'd like to, my personal view is, you know, it would be nice if they could collaborate because basically it means we're dealing with one entity, one new set of filing and licensing rather than another four set of things because it does streamline the process for those involved because they and it also streamlines our work so we can sort of focus on a, on other activities and i guess at the back of the slides you'll find a bit of information about what sort of information we look for when we do a filing or assess a filing but probably what i say is it's very similar to a business case which will be covered off largely the sort of similar information that the space agency is looking for as part of the grant program. So often, often when people apply to us, we say, look, we say to them, you probably already got this information available, just see what you can reuse. It's only a very niche piece of information that we often need to be created especially for that. And it's really about the technical and discussion with Australian satellite operators. And if we go into the next slide, um, I'm just really repeating my common theme here that spectrum is shared. And if I illustrate there, there's basically a picture of a map and one band, it's got lots of purpley little lines, which is basically fixed point to point micro link way links. And the other frame, if you can picture, you can see it, the little docks are basically where earth stations are operating the same band. So luckily for fixed point-to-point -point links and earth stations, particularly those working to a geostationary orbit, share quite well because of antenna discrimination. But the message is you do need to select your site carefully. Um, I sometimes have another slide which shows we have a what we call earth station protection zones. Um, there's one in Minginu in Western Australia, which sort of, for those who know Western Australia, it's sort of east of Geraldton somewhere. Uh, and then in, in the East Coast, there hasn't really been a, we have some theoretical locations, but it hasn't really developed in, into sort of a real facility yet. And Minginu dates back many years and it was a slow growth, but now it's there. Um, and, and the pretty picture called the Spectrum Allocations World Chart is really trying to illustrate, another way of trying to illustrate that Spectrum is shared. So wherever you see multiple colours in the same horizontal line, that means you could have a multiple range of services operating there. What that means is from the ACMA perspective, we may restrict the use of some services in some areas. So we may say like fixed point to points on earth stations work quite well on some bands, but when they may say in other bands, right, we're going to restrict the earth stations out of side of capital city areas. So we're going to things like the wireless video cameras for news and sport that I mentioned before. Um, and I realise I've gone through that pretty quick, but if you want to just quick flew to the next slide, I'll, I'll quickly describe. Thinking about, thank you, everyone. But if we go to the next one. So, just to give you a quick illustration and a few things. So here's some background on a filing. And I said before, not before I have a launch, before rock, rockets business case. 
and a few little sets a bit of background on what you knew if you want to do a satellite filing just beware there are cost recovery fees and for the ITU fees they very much vary on, on what you do if we go to the next slide um, the thing is space there's always lots of information to read up so I've got I've got three slides on references so these are ACMA references about space in itself so it's got the filing references, the procedures we use to assess license application against, and a bit about our charges. Um, if you're doing a filing, you should probably have a look at those. Here's some general references, and here where I sort of plug, you seek professional help, and because like they will understand immediately what are all those about. Some are very simple, some are very complex, but again, this is just ACMA references. If you would, next slide, please. And if you do want to go into the, do the satellite filing procedure process yourself, the ITU has a lot of reference material on there. But like I said, you would have seen before that there are a number of universities have done filings before and other research entities. So my m message is sort of seek professional help, phone a friend to see what you can learn from others who've been involved in the process before. And uh, why some of the IT information, you, you, it's sort of um, behind, you need a password, all this information is here. And the IT has received bit is a bit where you can actually click on and see what filings people have submitted to the ITU and you can get some general information out there. Uh, you do need some IT or software to make sense of it because it, all the information submitted to the ITU comes across in a Microsoft Access database. So you, you do, do need to understand the database format to work, work it through. Um, I'll end there. I realise I rushed through very quickly, but um, if we look uh, on the ACMA general references, there was a contact number both for the general inquiries and for the space team. I'm always happy to take inquiries. Normally what happens when people do a filing is once they've got a reasonable idea of what they want to do, they come and talk to us and we talk them through the process. It's a bit iterative. And if you want to talk about timing, for licensing, if you've got a professional and they know what they're doing, it can be as quick as five days turn around. But if there's any sort of issues with other existing parties, it can take longer. For satellite filings, we have an arrangement where new, new companies have to go through our board approval process. So obviously, that takes a bit more time. Um, for existing satellite operators, it's, it's reasonably short, short. But the key is always making sure you've got the information available that you have a focused approach and when we have a question you come back to us pretty quickly because delays in you replying to us mean delays in us and doing work and, and we may get distracted in the meantime and go off to do something else. So if you want to watch all of them between six to nine months for a new person who hasn't been through the filing process before, if you've been through the filing process before and you have all the information available, we can turn it over in two to four weeks. So. There is a big advantage to working in partnership with people who've been through this process before because it does somewhat simplify the process. And I'll end there. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, I do see that there's a hand up uh, with Jose, but if you wouldn't mind, um, we'll keep all the questions to the very end uh, and then I'll direct it to Mark um, in the Q&A session. Um, so next up, we have uh, Mr. Saurabh Sap. Um, he's an assistant director uh, at Defence uh, in the Department of Defence. Um, specifically, he's come to talk about defence export controls. So uh, take it away, Saurabh. Hello. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so yes, my name is Saurabh Sapre. I work in the technical assessments team in defence export controls. Um, the technical assessment team is the one that assesses every application that comes in to determine whether it falls under our legislative criteria. We also have a risk assessment team that assesses the risk of every export and a regulatory affairs and compliance team that work on compliance activities. Um, so throughout this, I'm mainly going to give you guys a DSGL 101 followed by a small case study uh, and then go over some common misconceptions that we normally see. Um, but first of all, why should you care about export controls? Um, firstly, export controls safeguards Australia's national interest, reputation and intellectual property. Um, it's uh, a very important reason why we exist. 
Secondly, it also ensures that we have access to technology and Australia maintains its reputation as a trusted trader. If we lose um, this trust um, our, with our international partners, we'll decrease Australia's opportunities to collaborate and share technologies. Um, another reason is because export controls are not optional, it's a legal obligation um, and financial and criminal uh, penalties can apply um, if you breach export control legislation. Um, integrity also matters and you, your, your, your and your organization's professional reputation could be at stake if you breach export controls. Uh, and lastly, your activities could be dis disrupted in, in unexpected ways, costing you time and money um, if you don't adhere to export controls as well. The most important thing from this is that industry, risk, research organization and government need to work together to help ensure that we maintain our international reputation. Next slide, please. So on behalf of the Australian government, defense regulates military and dual use items that have the potential applications to military and WMD programs. The DSGL is a control list that's agreed upon by international export control regimes that Australia is a member of. The two main ones to everybody here are the Vasana arrangement and the missile technology control regime. Um, the DSGL is also available online uh, on our website and on legislation.au as well. Goods are, goods are controlled or not controlled. Next slide, please. So the DSGL is split into two main parts. Um, it specifies the goods, software, and technology that are controlled when exported, supplied, so supplied by intangible means, so email, uh, downloads through a server or the like, brokering, or publication. So there are two main parts in the DSGL. The first part is munition list. So that's for all goods that are specially designed or modified for military use. And part two, which is going to be the large be more the focus for everybody here um, are the dual use uh, uh, control list. Next slide. So part one of the DSGL, um, we have ML codes one to 20 um, and they contain items uh, including systems, parts and components that are specially designed for military use. Um, they, are, they do make up a small portion of the DSGL um, but they cover everything from tanks, missiles, um, including military satellites, um, firearms, explosives, um, most of the main military applications. Uh, in addition to that, we have software and technology controls. So any software or technology associated with those military items is also controlled. And the only Australian specific controls um, that we have in the DSGL in, are in the ML 901 to 9 series, which um, control firearms and explosives not covered anywhere else um, in the DSGO. Next slide, please. So part two of the DSGO are where um, goods, software and technology um, have both the military and civilian or industrial applications. Um, so you can see a full list there. They go from nuclear materials uh, to chemicals and toxins, materials processing technology, uh, electronics, computers, telecommunication, um, and cybersecurity or information security, sensors, lasers, navigation and avionics, ma uh, marine, um, aerospace and propulsion, aerospace and propulsion systems. Um, the one we see mostly from the space industry uh, typically fall in category six, which are sensors, um, navigation systems that are used in, for example, space launch vehicles, and lastly, the aerospace and propulsion system uh, category, which has pretty much all your other stuff, including payload, space launch vehicles, and the like. Next slide, please. Slide, please. So, so, so just deciphering, deciphering the DSGL. The DSGL. So, so anyone, if anyone has looked at the DSGL dual use list, they would have seen a code similar to the one that's on screen on screen right now. Um, the best way to look at it is the very first letter is always going to highlight what category we're looking at. So in this case, it's aerospace and propulsion. Um, the next letter is a subcategory, so whether it's a finished item, whether it's um, production or test equipment, uh, whether it's materials related to the production, 
um, of controlled equipment and, and DNER for software and technology for the development, production or use of controlled goods. The next letter tells you what export control regime that control falls under. So once again, bus and arrangement and the missile techno technology control regime are the ones that are the most important for, for this group of people. So in this particular case, we have 9A004.A, which uh, relates to space launch vehicles. Um, so a quick case study. So I'm sure this will um, be uh, relate to a lot of you. So if you your research organization has been tasked with developing a CubeSat, this CubeSat will be developed by international collaborators. The CubeSat will be manufactured in Australia, but then will be sent overseas for testing and then returned back to Australia and launch details are yet to be determined. So before we get any further, um, who thinks that this, this type of stuff is controlled? And um, we'll find that out together. So CubeSat development. Um, so first of all, why does Australia control CubeSat and the associated technology? There's a list on screen for both dual use and, and military applications for CubeSats. And we control because we control CubeSats because they can be used for both military and civilian applications. Uh, for example, communications, navigation, um, cartography, uh, meteorology, satellites, and the like. Next slide, please. Uh, so where are CubeSats controlled? So we typically ask, uh, if you're looking through the DSGL, um, these are the main questions to uh, ask yourself. First of all, is your is a CubeSat specially designed for military use? So if you're working with a military organization, this might be true. Um, there's a sp particular control in the munitions list called ML11A, which is a general military uh, electronics control, which would control um, a military satellite. Um, question two, if you're looking at dual use controls, um, it's important to drill down into where it, where would be the most likely control. So in this case, when you look at all the controls, um, aerospace and propulsion systems are most likely where you're going to end up. Next slide, please. So as you can see, CubeSats would be controlled in category nine of the DSGL. Um, 9A004 has um, various different controls for space launch vehicles spacecraft, spacecraft buses, payloads, um, and various other systems. Um, I have the definition for spacecraft payloads on screen. Um, it, it includes incorporated goods that are controlled uh, elsewhere in the DSGL as well. So for example, camera systems, um, telecommunications equipment, and the like as well. Uh, next slide, please. So if you... Oh, Next. So will you need an export permit um, to, for international collaboration? Yes, um, there are a few minor exceptions. Those relate to verbal um, discussion that you may have. Um, so not really applicable to for an entire project. When should you come to see DEC for a permit? As soon as possible. The earlier you come to see us, the better. Um, will this permit process delay the development or production of the CubeSat? No. If you reach out to Defence Export Controls early, in most cases we can create a custom multi-shipment permit for the life of the project, which can be up to five years. Um, and we typically finalise these applications within 35 business days. Next slide. Um, so a member of your research team has decided to move overseas, but is still gonna collaborate on this project. Will they need an export permit? Yes, once again, the same exceptions apply. So any vocal, if you just call somebody up to say, how's the project going? That's probably not going to need an export permit. But if you start emailing back and forwards, um, some design documentation or something similar, you would need an export permit for that. Um, if you decide to publish your findings, will you need an export permit? So no, there's another exemption here. So for the academics out there who want to publish um, or have pre-publication technology that 
you're going to be transferring, for example, for a peer review process, um, you don't need an export permit for that. However, you still need a permit for collaboration until that point, and if you do any further collaboration after this point, you'll still need an export permit. If the CubeSat is specially designed for military use, however, you will need a publication permit. Um, would conference posters require an export permit? And that the answer is a maybe. So it depends on the level of detail and what is already published in the public domain. So if you're confused about any of these, please come see us and we can have a conversation about what is and what is not controlled. Um, so also, will you need a permit to export the CubeSat for testing? Yes, so CubeSats are controlled on the 9A004 of the DSGL. So if you export it overseas for it to be tested, for example, to the US, um, you will need an export permit for the testing to be completed. Um, and then likely another export permit from the US back to Australia um, as well. So when should you come to DEC for a permit? As soon as you know what you're sending and where you're sending it to. So when you know the testing laboratory, for example, uh, submit your export permit application. You, just because you have a permit doesn't mean you have to use it. So, uh, and we can always renew a permit if you haven't used it yet as well, which um, makes the process a little bit quicker as well. Next slide. Um, so also, will you need a permit if you're launching the CubeSat overseas? Yes, definitely. So a lot of the people here, I assume, are going to be exporting uh, space-related equipment overseas that will be launched potentially in India. Um, in that particular case, you will need an export permit. Will you need an export permit to launch the CubeSat from Australia? No. Export controls only apply if the goods are intended to arrive in another country. Next slide. So just quickly, some common misconception and mistakes and myths that we hear almost all the time. It's commercial off the shelf, so it's not controlled. That's false. There are many things that are available online um, that, are, that you can just buy off the shelf that are controlled. Um, I'm not interested in military applications of my technology, therefore nobody else will be interested in that is also false. Just because you're not uh, interested in the military applications does not change the fact that your systems could be used in that way, so could have controls. Um, if I take it with me on, as carry-on luggage, I don't have to worry about it. That's also false. Um, the Australian Border Force is there at airports as well and screening luggage. If they find something that's um, that should be controlled, they will let us know um, and we'll have to go through that process. If you're sending it information via email SMS, or SMS, that isn't an export, that's also false. So the intangible supply of software or technology is controlled. So it doesn't matter if you're doing it online or it doesn't matter if um, it's just sending a message uh, with somebody with, for example, schematics, that would be uh, a controlled export activity and you would need an export permit for that. And lastly, export controls are a hindrance and will stop me from collaborating on pro progressing my project goal. Once again, that's false. To us quick, come to us early in your process and we can create a bespoke permit that will enable you to have to do your research in collaboration with any international partners that you may have. Um, so lastly, there's a there's all the information about defense export controls. If you have any questions uh, that aren't that we aren't able to answer today, you can call the 1-800 number or email exportcontrols at defense.gov.au and we will get back to you with, with any questions you have. Um, for everyone, that's for those of you online that are within Australia, we also regularly hold in industry outreach as well. We go to almost every major city every couple of months or every at least once a year. Um, so keep an eye out for that as well. Um, and that includes both personal, uh, in-person and virtual meetings as well. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Zarab. Um, all questions, uh, I've, I've taken a note of the ones in the chat, um, but yes, I'll, I'll direct them back to you in, in the Q&A session, or if we don't get through them, um, we'll, we'll take them on notice and send them out to everybody. Um, next up is Tamara Bell. She is Acting Senior Advisor for Defence and Space with Austrade. So over to you, Tamara.
Thanks, Elise. I'd uh, like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today. And I would also like to pay my respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging. The Australian Trade and Investment Commission builds a stronger economy by accelerating the growth of Australian exporters, attracting productive foreign investment and stimulating recovery in the visitor economy. Through our network of more than 1,300 experts in 66 international markets, we give Australian businesses a competitive edge in the global marketplace. We equip Australian businesses with expert advice, contacts, grants, and practical assistance on the ground to export their goods and services overseas. Australia has worked closely with the Australian Space Agency since its establishment in 2018, collaborating on numerous industry initiatives, delegations, and industry intelligent work aimed at helping achieve the government's vision of a thriving Australian space sector. This includes joint missions to key global space events, including the Space Symposium, the Farnborough International Air Show, and the International Astronautical Congress and a space industry capability platform that is being developed. Uh, this will be with the Space Industry Association of Australia and the SmartSat CRC to provide both domestic and international stakeholders alike with a clear understanding of the unique capabilities of Australian space companies and the opportunities in the sector more broadly. To support this work, Austrade have a dedicated space sector practice that services Australian space companies seeking to grow their businesses abroad as well as investors that are looking to familiarise themselves with the growing opportunities in Australia. If you'd like to learn more on how Austrade can help your company connect with Australia's growing space sector, please reach out to one of our representatives or to support your business exporting overseas. Thanks, Elise. All right, thanks, Tamara. So for our final invited speaker, we've got Pete Hunter. Uh, he's an assistant manager for the portfolio program delivery team, the grants delivery team, uh, and his, they will be the first port of contact for you uh, if you've got any questions for your, your application. So over to you, Pete. And if you are there, you're on mute. Still on mute. Let me see if you've dropped off the call. All right, very mysterious. <laughs> uh, have we got anyone else from the grants delivery team online? Uh, potentially Katina, if you're here, that might be happy to speak to Pete's slide. All right, no worries, I'll just read through it. Uh, can you hear me, Liz? Oh, <laughs> I can hear you so many times, Pete, you're echoing. Yeah, we've got massive down. Um, okay, how's that? Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Okay, not quite sure exactly what happened there. So um, everything was working on our end, but it is what it is. Um, thank you, Elise. Uh, welcome to everyone. Um, yes, so we're, we're the first point of uh, contact uh, for the for the grants itself. Um, we do have a designated team. Um, so my senior project uh, manager, uh, which is um, Katina Devil, um, she's a she's a team lead. Um, so like any inquiries can actually be fed through us uh, about the program. If you have any um, questions, um, any anything at all, basically. So you can come directly to our uh, space grants at industry.gov.au um, and we'll be able to get back uh, in touch with you and actually um, provide any um, uh, questions and answers. Um, when it does come down to a technical side of things, we can obviously uh, talk with the agency about those ones. Um, Elise has gone through obviously uh, the guidelines themselves um, so you know please feel free to obviously have a look at the, uh, the BGA website. Uh, one of the most important things about uh, going through the application process is that once we do 
the assessments. Um, and if you are actually deemed as recommended for funding, um, you cannot actually start your project before the grant agreement has actually been executed. So none of the um, of the funding or the um, would be deemed as eligible expenditure. Um, when the applications do come through, um, we will run through them with our team for um, eligibility, um, and then they'll actually be assessed by uh, an independent committee um, and an expert committee as well. So all of the information that you provide with your supplementary documentation, which obviously um, yeah, relates directly to the application itself, um, all of that will be uh, assessed um, and then the, uh, the committee will actually make the recommendations. So the decision maker is the head of the agency. So at this stage, it's uh, Enrico Palermo. Um, and so the decision maker, once a decision has been made, um, all decisions are final. Um, we'll actually obviously liaise very closely with our uh, minister's office. Um, and so once uh, the actual grants uh, are looking at being executed, uh, we'll work very closely with the agency and obviously with the successful recipients as well to ensure the content uh, agreements um, are exactly uh, deliverable and measurable as well. Um, so, you know, it's uh, we're, we're looking forward to obviously uh, having lots of applications being put through. At least did say that the minimum project amount is uh, a $1 million project. Uh, the maximum project amount is also $10 million. And we do have um, $18 million uh, for funding made available for this particular program. Thank you, Elise. All right, thanks, Pete. So if we get to the next slide, yep. OK, so I have been making a note of the questions in the chat. Um, but if you've got any any further ones, just pop them in now. Um, any that we don't get to, as I mentioned, we will provide them um, along and, and answers along with the presentation and when we send it out to everyone that was registered today. Um, just a reminder uh, to register for the roundtable, which is coming up in two weeks on the 12th of April. Um, I put a link in the chat to the BGA page and there's an information and roundtable sessions section and you can just register. There's a link there and it will take you to the Eventbrite registration page. Um, so thought I'd just maybe cover off a few of the common questions that we got across the consultations um, before we get stuck into the more specific ones. So first of all, um, common one that came up was uh, a query on the 80%, 20% uh, funding split between Australian and Indian organisations. Um, unfortunately, this is a requirement of the legislation um, that the grant opportunity is governed under. Um, so we're not able to, to um, balance out the split uh, for this program, but we certainly have taken your feedback on board for that um, and we'll look at applying it for, um, for future programs. Um, co-contributions, I did touch on a little bit earlier, so we are not requiring co-contributions as a criteria for eligibility for this grant, um, but you can obviously, uh, if, you, if you do have them, you can uh, put them in the financial section of your application. Um, I did see a question come through in the chat as well on if multiple applications are possible. And the answer to that is yes, they are. Um, you can be a partner on multiple applications. And I believe, Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, you can actually lead multiple as well. Um, but you do have to provide evidence that you can successfully deliver um, or across all of these projects. Um, and finally, IP ownership. So we, we had some questions about whether the agency is seeking to own any of the IP uh, that's generated from these projects. And the answer is no, we aren't. Um, all the IP will be owned by the applicants, um, all the consortium members, and it's very much up to you to um, organise how you'll manage the IP uh, within your consortia. So you can work out how you'd like to share ownership of that. Um, so that's it for frequent ones. Uh, just a note, if you've got any questions um, on the application process, uh, you can forward them to the space grants at industry.gov.au um, email just there on the bottom of the slide. Uh, and I was just anyone that registers for the roundtable, um, I will provide you with um, an email address through your through the email that you have registered with uh, further details about um, providing the, the slide for your pictures uh, and any kind of organizational um, details ahead of time. So uh, if you've registered there, then that's fine. We'll be in touch. Uh, OK, I might move on and open the general 
Q&A. So I had a couple of uh, maybe broad ones and um, I might try and answer and Arvind, you can uh, fill in the blanks here. But we, early in the session, I had one from Anaga Nimbekar. Uh, is neuromorphic computing related to any of the interest areas? And also Neil Kant Kundu, uh, space quantum communications and quantum satellites also topics of interest. So these are suggestions of topics of interest, and I would say they are eligible as long as you can justify uh, that they will align with or advance capability within um, those mutual priority areas. Um, anything to add there, Arvind? No, uh, you, you covered it pretty well, Elise. So as long as you can uh, demonstrate your um, eligibility and alignment, uh, neuromorphic computing, for example, could have alignment with the Earth observations. Uh, same with uh, intersatellite communications and uh, several other topics. So if you can demonstrate that alignment, uh, we are pretty happy to take in applications of any, any technologies. OK, uh, and I also had a question. It was, is FCRA registration required for the Indian partner? Um, and I might uh, send this one to Pete if I can. Thanks, Elise. Um, yeah, so when it comes down to foreign contributions, um, I don't think that we actually have uh, any registration requirements for those ones. Um, but, you know, so the contributions can be either foreign or domestic. Perfect. OK, thank you. Um, now, Mark, if you are still online, a couple came up during your talk. So from Sato Ryuchi, uh, how long does it typically take to obtain yeah, a radio yeah. oh, a radio so frequency you, license? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I did touch on that. It really depends on whether you have your all, all your information ready for the application when you apply. So it's a two stage process. First of all, you need to find what I call one of the accredited persons to the application for you because we basically, like I said, we've been outsourced a long time. But if we've got everything in, it comes in pretty well. There's a what's called a wider government consultation process and all license application that takes five days. And once that completed, it can be basically out the door and issued and then it's an automatic computer process. So it depends on how long the computers take to because it's submitted electronically, so it goes through the system, licensing phase. So five days, five, six days can be done as quick as that. So uh, that, there but it can a, take longer if you don't have all the information. There was a second part to that question, and it was, um, is there an expedited application process? Well, I think myself, five days is a pretty That's good That's pretty turnaround. good. <laughs> but okay. like I said, if you've got questions and you're doing something a bit unique, we are there to help. Um, obviously, it's a lot different if you're doing a satellite support event for a, um, a football function or, you know, AFL. That's pretty routine. That can get chunked through the system quite quickly. If you're doing something a bit more different, like launch support or something, it may take a bit longer. But, but normally, the accredited persons and like all professional service, I advise to seek recommendations which ones to use because some are more, more experienced than others. Those that know what they're doing, they know who to talk to, who to ask and get the paperwork ready to to go. So even those ones can be done in five to six days, the right paperwork. But you got to remember if they have to go talk to another satellite operator or a station operator or, you know, for a, a tele television channel because they wanted to use the same inspection that use of wireless cameras, admittedly some of the dots in the remote, remote places in my presentation, that'll take time. But if there's a justifiable case, yes, we should do try to work things through. But like I said, five to six days I thought was pretty good. Uh, and I think this one was during your presentation as well, Mark. So this is from Anaga Nimbakar. Um, is there any area related to non-destructive testing? I thought that may relate to one of your maps. Um, that's probably more covered by other types of regulations rather than rather than spectrum. We really look at the tech, you know, spectrum management. That sounds like. Uh, state or other areas in state or federal governments to me. OK, um, so Saurabh, some of the questions that came up in your presentation. Um, do FIRB regulations apply to commercial space business consortia between an Indian entity and an existing Australian entity? Uh, this is Amit Shah. Amit, if you're online, um, if you'd like to uh, add any detail to your question. 
happen, please. Oh, maybe they've dropped off. I will. Um, uh, thanks, oh. Elise. Sorry, I dropped oh. off there. Um, yeah, but the question um, actually was uh, targeted towards the FIRB regulations with regards to the business um, and the business investments. So, uh, if there is if there is uh, an opportunity which uh, which is presented to an Indian investor to come into you know invest into a startup. Uh, in Australia, which is an Australian entity. How does that figure and what are the regulations that we need to take care of? Um, so Amit, I might jump in here and uh, Tamara is probably the best qualified to answer this, but with respect to the particular grant program that we are talking about, the investment or co-investment will be for that particular project. It will not be an investment into the business. Um, so the investors, so we are looking at collaborations to put in joint mission applications, like for example, uh, CubeSat mission, which could be approximately say $5 million of a project. Uh, the co-investment would be for that particular project and that could be say $300,000 worth of testing. So that's the kind of investment this program is looking for. But with that, I'll pass to Tamara who can uh, talk about business investments, which is a different topic. You're just on mute, Tamara. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thanks, Arvin. Um, So facilitating engagement with the Foreign Investment Review Board is something that Austrade supports and facilitates. Uh, so I guess we just need to find out some more information to be able to provide the correct advice. So I'll pop my email address in the chat for anyone that would like to reach out and I can connect you with my investment colleagues or the appropriate people uh, in our organisation. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Romara. Um, I look forward to that email. Thanks. Keep in touch. Okay, so moving on. Uh, next one was, is DISP accreditation a requirement for any defense related applications? Um, I can take this question. Um, so, or, yeah, you go, Saro. No, you can go. Now, I was going to say, uh, I'm, I might contradict you. So you go first. I'll, I'll add on to you. The best qualified there. Sure. Um, if you're, you don't need a DISP accreditation to apply for an export control permit. However, um, if you're having a contract within with defense, uh, the Australian defense, uh, you are more than likely going to require a DISP accreditation. And the level of DISP accreditation that you require will depend on the sensitivities um, of the project itself. Uh, um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, exactly the same answer, but uh, with respect to this particular grant and the grant guidelines, we're looking at civil space priority areas and civil space projects. And uh, if your company is a defense supplier and a customer to defense projects and stuff like that, you will probably have your dis uh, arrangements with defense, but uh, we are not looking for this accreditation with respect to all of these projects that we are talking about. Okay, um, I'll move to the next one, which is, uh, were there any recommendations on how to navigate the US uh, processes if that is necessary? And I might suggest, uh, Saurabh, you can take that if you like, but I was going to suggest that maybe that one's better directed to your inquiries inbox um, or one of your uh, one of your call lines, but up to you. Uh, yes. You can send an email to us. Uh, we can do our best to help, but there are but uh, Australian defense export controls um, don't provide any input to industry on how to navigate the US process. Um, there are organizations within Australia and I assume, of course, abroad as well that will help people navigate the US process of export controls as well as um, any other uh, export control regulations that that you may need um, during your pro project. All right, so next question is from Clarissa Luck. Um, will the spacecraft be within scope of DSGL if the actual CubeSat is not designed and manufactured in Australia, but it is Australian procured or owned? Um, my answer to this is 
if the Q, if the spacecraft or the CubeSat is uh, going to be exported from Australia, irrespective of who the owner is and irrespective of who the destination is, so whether it's New Zealand, the US, India, or anybody else, anywhere else, you will need an export permit. It's not based on who manufactured it or who designed it or where you're going. It's the fact that it's leaving the Australian shore uh, and be going to another country. Okay, perfect. So I'll just scroll up in the chat and grab some more. So is there a cap on the number of grants an Indian company as a partner can be awarded? So this one was uh, somewhat covered in the frequently asked questions. So there isn't a cap on the number of grants you can like be a part of, um, but you do have to provide evidence that you can deliver against all of them. So um, it will be pretty challenging uh, to, to be depending on how many uh, applications you're you're looking at being a part of um, but there is no cap so there's the answer there um, next one being an indian i want to invest in australian companies with a minority stakeholder less than 10 percent if i'm on board with above minority stakeholding will it affect the australian grant process this one's an anonymous question so i'm not sure who might want to ask this one maybe in more detail. Hi, actually, yeah. uh, sorry, somebody put in under my name. Uh, ah. My name is Basil, so I didn't put that question here. Maybe some bug or something like that. Um, that's all right, Elise. I think we'll skip this. Um, all right. We could take it offline, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, not for that. This, this is Ajay Hans. Uh, this question was put up by me. If you allow oh. me, can I put it? Please. Uh, like that. No. Like uh, I said, if I'm on a board of an Australian company, startup company, and uh, that is related to the space uh, development program, so will any uh, objections or any kind of restrictions for the grant if, if a foreign uh, person is on the board of an Australian company? Uh, Pete, probably. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one, Arvind. Um, no, no, that's fine. Um, you know, as, as long as there's obviously uh, no conflicts uh, between obviously the uh, the application and the Australian Commonwealth, um, you know, ha having a, a foreign um, person um, on, on the board, that's that's no problem. That's not a problem. Thank you. Thanks a lot. OK, next one, we've got Mark Ramsey. Uh, this is a request for a financial year breakdown of the grant funding over four years. Um, are we able to provide this grants team? Uh, I, I think at this particular stage, uh, no. Um, and reason being is that, you know, we do have a bucket of funding for, for 18 million um, because there has been obviously a, a major pause uh, considering what has happened with the, the new government coming through. Um, we're still working out funding availability um, at this particular stage. So more, more details will be uh, notified um, at, at, um, at a given stage. Um, Elise, Chris DeLewis, General Manager OSR, wanted to jump in with a quick thought. So, Chris, if you're online. Yeah, I am. Hello, everyone. Um, I won't go on video. Chris DeLewis, General Manager of the Space Regulator, Alistair K works uh, with me. I just wanted to reiterate um, for, for anyone interested in, um, I guess, launching satellites, that there is a particular requirement where something's Australian versus um, where it's not and i guess what i'd ask anyone who's working in that space to make sure they make their own inquiries as to whether they need an overseas payload permit for example if you're an australian organization working with an indian firm to launch something in india or anywhere else um, that overseas payload permit which alistair mentioned um, may apply so i just ask you to to, to ensure you make your inquiries because i've had a number of occurrences where australian organizations didn't realize there was an obligation on them to do something in regards to that, and it's right at the last minute. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process, so it just needs to be done, not at the last minute. The last thing I just wanted to mention, um, I guess, as a sort of the senior one of the senior execs of the agency here, is um, the team here have put together this briefing to try and put all the relevant matters in the one place, uh, which is I think is really valuable. Uh, it's important to recognise that each of the so the grant. Um, decision-making process, any regulatory processes, 
uh, you know, FERB, if that's relevant, they're all processes that are managed and decided in separate manners. So they don't, they don't influence each other necessarily. They're separate administrative decisions. So if you're engaging with the agency, um, I'd ask you just to ask yourself, why am I engaging with the agency on? If it's a regulatory matter, then come to the regulator, um, not the CTO, for example. So it, it just helps um, helps us um, interact with the sector to try and avoid uh, confusion. Thanks, Ivan. Thank you, Chris. OK, I might. we've got two minutes left, so I'm just going to run down the list. Uh, Graham from Next Aero, any information on the expert committee? I'm going to assume you mean the assessment committee. Uh, is that right? I think that's what it's referring to. And uh, yeah, in at this which stage, case, we don't. <laughs> no, there is no information yet. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Byron, uh, presumably the 80% rule only applies for the Australian government uh, contribution. Is that correct? So, Pete, uh, the 80% of funding to be spent in Australia, that's only for the grant funding and not including any contributions that might come through. Is that right? So it's for all of the investment. Um, so if someone's actually coming forward and actually having, say, uh, a $10 million project, uh, then 80% of that um, is a requirement to be spent in Australia. So it, even if we're looking at uh, only providing, say, $5 million uh, as a grant, uh, the entire investment needs to be that, that 80%. So it is on all of the eligible expenditure. And just related to that, there's a question further on. Are overseas launch costs part of the Australian investment portion of the 80% uh, split? Uh, yes, as long as it's directly related to the project itself. Perfect. Uh, how is the funding distributed to Indian partners via the lead organisation? Uh, I think that's you again. So the funding, the, it's the lead applicant that enters into the grant agreement. So yeah, I'll let correct. you take it. So, yeah, lead, lead, lead applicant uh, will end up having the um, the agreement with the Commonwealth. Um, and then the lead applicant uh, will then, you know, divvy out the money to obviously the project partners or the other consortium members. Perfect. And maybe I'll just take one more Uh or a couple more, these ones are short. So clarify what types of Indian partner is needed. Is it optional or a must have? Um, so there's no specification on the type of Indian partner that you, you will need to have, but you for this program, you will need to have uh, an Indian partnering organisation um, as part of your application. Um, so it is mandatory. Um, there's another question, are AI solutions using Earth observation eligible for the program? Um, and that's another similar answer to one that has come before. So provided that um, your AI solutions, you can justify how they align with those mutual priority areas and will increase capability there, then, um, then that would be eligible. Um, oh, there's quite a few to go. So I think since it's 5.31, we might stop there and we'll get um, we'll take the rest of those on notice and circulate the answers to you when we send out the slide deck. Um, so thank you to uh, all the invited speakers that gave their presentations here today. Um, it was really great to have you and thanks also to my agency colleagues. Um, with that, we might wrap up and thank you to everyone who came. Don't forget to register for the roundtable um, if you'd like to come along to that. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Can you please provide the link for the roundtable? Uh, sure, it's in the chat still. Oh, how do we stop recording? I'll do that. <laughs> to jump off. All I'll, right. Yeah. See you, Liz. Thank you.